Right, this is a fairly straightforward C2 question on the binomial expansion. We have to expand 3 minus x to the power 6, um, so let's get on with it straight away. Uh, we always start with the first term in your bracket to the power that you're given. So we have 3 to the power 6. And um, what's invisible there is the first coefficient, which is, is 1. We know that the first number in any row of Pascal's triangle is 1. So that's an invisible 6, choose 0. So anything choose 0 equals 1. Similarly, you should memorize the fact that anything choose 1 is itself. So 6 choose 1 is equal to 6. Um, 7 choose 1 would be 7, and so on. So we can put that coefficient straight in without using the calculator. And then we just notice that the power of 3 decreases by 1 from 6 down to 5. And then we introduce the second term in my bracket, not forgetting the minus sign. So it's minus x to the power 1. And we carry on that pattern. So um, I don't know what 6 choose 2 is. So uh, I'll just write 6 choose 2 and we'll work that out on the calculator in a moment. Um, but the power of 3 decreases again, so from 5 down to 4. And the power of minus x has to increase, so that goes up to minus x squared. Um, so those are the first three terms. It's worth noting at this point that um, the power that we've got, uh, the power of 6, um, that's what the powers must add up to in each term. So 5 add 1 is 6, 4 add 2 is 6, and that pattern would carry on with however many terms we had. The other thing that's really important here is have the brackets around the minus x. If you just wrote minus x squared without the brackets, that would not get you a method mark. Um, so it's important to include the brackets. Okay, so all we need to do now is tidy it up. So 3 to the power 6, um, my calculator tells me, is 729. Um, and then the next thing I would do is look at the sign. I know I've got a minus x there, so my next term is going to be negative, and then I can deal with the coefficients and the numbers. So 6 times 3 to the power 5, well, that's I do that on the calculator, but it's going to be twice as much as 3 to the power 6. Have a think about why. In any case, do that on the calculator, you get 1, 4, 5, 8, and that is times x. And again, the next term, think about the sign. We've got minus x, but now it's squared. So the minus sign is squared, which means the whole thing is positive. I've got my plus sign, and now I can just worry about the coefficients. 6 choose 2 is 15, and 3 to the power 4 is 81. And minus x squared, well, we've dealt with the sign, so we just write the x squared. It's worth noting that this pattern of negative, positive, negative, positive would carry on for as many terms as we included. Now all I have to do is simplify, and that doesn't mean anything for the first two terms because they're already simplified. All I have to do is work out 15 times 81, and that uh, comes to 1,215. Um, that's how many x squares I've got, and that is your answer. Right, in this C2 question we're given a function of x, and we're asked to find the remainder when f of x is divided by uh, x minus 3. So this requires the remainder theorem. It's a fairly simple one. You can substitute 3 in. f of 3 will give you the remainder that we're after. So 3 lots of 3 cubed, minus 5 lots of 3 squared, minus 5 lots of 3, 58 lots of 3, I beg your pardon, plus 40. And simplify that. 3 times 27, minus 5 times 9, minus 174, plus 40. Just take care not to make any errors here. There's nothing really complicated going on. And... When you work it all out, you should get minus 98. Straightforward, hopefully. Now the next bit, we're given that x minus 5 is a factor of f of x, and we want to find the solutions of f of x equals 0. So the fact that this is a factor means that we can divide f of x by x minus 5. So we can set this out in the standard way, and let's just go through the process. Start with um, how many times does x go into 3x cubed? The answer is 3x squared, which we write in the x squared column, and then we multiply that back down by the x first, and then by the minus 5, um, to get minus, five, uh, minus 15x squared. Next, we subtract um, these two terms here from the line above. Um, the first term will always cancel, um, if you're doing it right, and minus 5x squared take away minus 15x squared is 10x squared. And finally bring down the next term from the line above, and we'll repeat the process. So how many times does x go into 10x squared? Well it goes in 10x times. 
multiply the 10x by the x, we get 10x squared again. Multiply the 10x by the minus 5, we get minus 50x. And again, we're going to subtract this from the line above. The 10x squareds cancel. Minus 58x take away minus 50x is minus 8x. And finally, bring down the 40 from the line at the top. One more iteration of this. How many times does x go into minus 8x? Well, minus 8 times. Then multiply minus 8 by x to give me minus 8x. And multiply minus 8 by minus 5 to give me plus 40. The last bit here is always just a check. If you know it's a factor, it should be 0. And thank goodness it is. So I've divided by x minus 5. So that tells me I can rewrite my f of x as x minus 5, the thing that I've divided by, times the answer that we got from the division. So 3x squared plus 10x minus 8. And to complete the factorization, we want to factorize this quadratic part. Um, now, if you're good at this, I find it easy, feel free to skip through this part, but I'll take you through the way I factorize these. Okay, I note down the value of AC, so the first and last coefficients, they multiply to give minus 24, and write down the value of B, which is 10. And I'm looking for two numbers which multiply to give minus 24 and add to give 10, and that would be 12 and minus 2. And I use these to rewrite what's in the brackets for my quadratic. So we still have x minus 5 in front. We have 3x squared still, but the 10x I'm replacing with 12x minus 2x. Um, and I still have my minus 8. So that's where the 12 and the minus 2 come in. Um, and now we just need to take adjacent pairs here and factorize those the old-fashioned way. So we're going to say what goes into 3x squared and also goes into 12x. That's 3x taken outside the brackets. Repeat this for the second one, but we know that the bracket is going to be the same. So it's sometimes easier just to write the bracket first. So I know it's going to be x plus 4. And that lets me see quite easily that the number in front has to be minus 2 for this to work out. Um, and this gives me my two factors. Okay, x plus 4 is going to be one of the factors. Of course, we still have x minus 5 in the front. Um, the other factor comes from the two coefficients here in front, 3x and minus 2. So that gives me my final bracket, uh, 3x minus 2. So I've factorized f of x. All that remains is to solve the equation. So to put this factorized form equal to 0. And because it's factorized, I can read off from these brackets my three solutions. So from the first bracket, x equals 5. Or from the second bracket, x equals minus 4. Or from the third bracket, x equals 2 thirds. And those are my solutions. Right, this is a nice little arithmetic series question. Um, we're given this fact that the sum of the first 10 terms of the sequence is 162, and we're asked to show that this equation is true. So we're going to need the formula for the sum. So I'll jot that down, n over 2, brackets 2a plus n minus 1d. And the way to show this is to use the only fact that we've been given, but to put it into algebra. So we'll translate this. The sum of the first 10 terms, well, I can use the formula that I just wrote down. It's going to be 10 over 2, uh, brackets 2a plus 10 minus 1d. So I'm basically substituting n equals 10 into the sum formula. And, well, it is 162. That means it equals 162. And from here, it's just a case of simplifying. 10 over 2 is 5, 10 minus 1 is 9. And we simply multiply out the brackets, and it gives us exactly what we wanted. Okay. Part B, a bit more information. We're given the sixth term. So now we're dealing with a specific term, not the sum. So we need the formula for a particular term, a plus n minus 1d. And let's translate this fact into algebra. The sixth term, well, that's a plus 6 minus 1d. It is 17. That means it equals 17. So now we've got our other equation, and 6 minus 1 is 5. Dead simple. Finally, find the value of a and the value of d. Um, we just have to solve these two equations that we've got simultaneously. Various ways to do it. The simplest to me is to multiply the second equation by 10. 10a plus 50d is 170. And call that equation 3. We'll notice that in equation 3 and in equation 1, they both have 10a. And that was the whole point. I'm multiplying by 10. That means I can subtract 1 from 3. The 10a's cancel. So 50d minus 45d gives me 5d 
170 minus 162 gives me 8. And when I divide by 5, I get D is 8 over 5. Or if you prefer decimals, 1.6. Uh, now all that remains is for me to substitute that back into any of my equations. Uh, the simplest is number 2. Put it in equation 2, we get a plus 5 lots of d, which is 5 lots of 8 over 5, equals 17. Uh, 5 times 8 over 5 is just 8. That's jolly nice. And we can subtract 8 to get a equals 9. Job done. Right. The first part of this question really is checking whether you understand what a logarithm is all about. So can you see that um, in this relationship x is the base of your logarithm and the thing that log equals is the power. So the alternative way to write that is as your base raised to your power. So x raised to the power 2 and that equals 64. Once you write it like this it's dead easy. Just square root both sides. We get x equals 8. We don't need to worry about plus or minus 8 because in the question it says find the positive value of x. Job done. Okay, in part b we have a log equation and if we inspect it we'll see that we've got log to the base 2, log to the base 2 again, and then we've got another term that isn't a logarithm. When you see something like that, you know that what you want is to rearrange it to get one logarithm on one side and just a constant on the other side. In this case, it's going to end up as 3. So my first step is going to be to subtract uh, 2 log to the base 2 of x minus 1 to get rid of it from the right-hand side. And so on the left, I'll have 2, uh, I'll have the log to the base 2 of 11 minus 6x minus 2 log to the base 2 of x minus 1. On the right, I've just got a 3. Um, and now I start using my laws of logarithms. The 2 can come inside the logarithm as a power. So leaving the first log unchanged, I'll rewrite the second one as log to the base 2 of x minus 1 squared. So the 2 that was in front has come inside the logarithm as a power. And of course that's still equal to 3. Um, next I'm going to use the law that links the subtraction of two logarithms to a division within the logarithm. So I can write that as a single logarithm on the left hand side with 11 minus 6x uh, in the numerator and x minus 1 squared in the denominator. And again, that's still equal to 3. And at this point, we've achieved what we wanted. Okay, log to the base 2 of something equals 3. So looking at this relationship, 2 is the base, 3 is the power. So a bit like in part A, we can rewrite this. The thing inside the brackets, 11 minus 6x uh, divided by x minus 1 squared is going to be equal to, well, my base raised to my power. So my base is 2, so it's going to be 2 raised to the power. 3. So 2 cubed, and that's just 8. And from this point on, it's simply algebra. So if I give myself a little bit more space here, um, we're going to have to bring the x minus 1 squared up into the numerator. So I multiply both sides by x minus 1 squared. I'll get 8 lots of x minus 1 squared on the right. Expand those brackets. 8 lots of x squared minus 2x plus 1. And then expand those brackets, 8x squared minus 16x plus the 8. And of course, on the other side, that's still equal to 11 minus 6x. You can see now that this is a quadratic, so we want to rearrange it to the standard form where we've got 0 on one side and all the other terms gathered on the other side. And it makes sense for that to be gathered on the right, where x squared is positive. So 8x squared minus 10x uh, minus 3. Now, this does factorise. It looks a bit it looks a bit nasty, but it factorises quite easily in the end. Um, you could use the formula if you like, um, but you have to get to the solution from this. So 4x plus 1, and the other bracket is 2x minus 3. So we can read off our solutions from there. Uh, so uh, from the first bracket, if 4x plus 1 is 0, uh, then x would be minus a quarter. And from the second bracket, if 2x minus 3 equals 0, x would be a positive 3 over 2. Now actually we find out that we have to disregard minus a quarter um, and take 3 over 2 as our solution. If we look up at the original equation, this x minus 1 illustrates why, because if x were minus a quarter, x minus 1 would be a negative number. And you should know that you cannot have a logarithm of a negative number. 
Um, in this case, the mark scheme is quite lenient. You can include that in your solution as long as you do include the 3 over 2 because um, it's not really that that they're testing. That's it. Right, for this C2 question, we're given the equation of a circle C. Uh, we're asked to find the center and the radius. Um, these two things go hand in hand um, and require the same method, so let's get on with it. Um, the first step is to uh, gather together or to group your x terms and your y terms. So we've got x squared and 4x, and we'll write those down uh, to simply write them together. So x squared plus 4x. Um, looking at the y terms, we have y squared minus 2y. So we'll write those together, y squared minus 2y. And of course, we've still got minus 11, and we've still got equals 0. The next step is to complete the square. Um, so we're going to look at the x terms first, and then the y terms. So x squared plus 4x. Um, inside my bracket, I'm going to have x plus, and then half of this number here. So it's always half of the coefficient of x, in this case 2 and that bracket is squared, but we have to subtract the thing that we don't have above, which is 2 squared. Okay, so the second thing in my bracket squared, that's always what you subtract. Same process for y. Um, we've got y squared minus 2y, so I'll have a plus um, because the y term is positive, or the squared term is positive. And then we've got y minus, again, half of the coefficient of y, which is just 1. So y minus 1 squared, and again we have to subtract the second term in the brackets squared, so minus 1 squared. Um, and of course again we've still got the minus 11, we haven't done anything with that yet, and it's still equal to 0. Um, it's worth noting that these bits here are always negative, Okay, you're always subtracting um, because you're removing something uh, that shouldn't be there. Um, so now we just have to basically tidy up, Okay, we want to have uh, x plus something squared on the left and y plus something squared on the left. Um, but all the numbers you want to shift to the right, so we'll add the 11, the 1 and the 4 from 2 squared, add those to the right and we get 16. And that gives us our uh, all the details of our circle. We can read off the center, the coordinates, um, from 2 and minus 1, we simply reverse the signs, so the center is minus 2, 1. And the number on the right hand side is the radius squared. So we just need to uh, square root 16. So we have center minus 2, 1, and radius of 4. Right, moving on to part C. Um, we're asked for the coordinates of the point where C crosses the y-axis. Now where any curve crosses the y-axis is where x equals 0. So we need to substitute this back into the equation. And we could use the original one, but it's actually quite neat and helpful to use uh, this version, okay? Uh, you'll see why in a moment. So if we substitute x equals 0 into that, let's see what we get. Well, the first term is 0 plus 2 squared um, plus y minus 1 squared is equal to 16. Um, obviously, 0 plus 2 is just 2. Square that, you get 4. So we have 4 plus y minus 1 squared equals 16. Now, I'm not multiplying out the brackets there because that would be counterproductive, it actually helps me to have them like that. Because now if I subtract the 4, you can see I get y minus 1 squared equals 12, and I can simply square root both sides. So y minus 1 is the square root of 12. Not forgetting the plus or minus, that gives me my two solutions, so it's important to have that. So y minus 1 is plus or minus uh, 2 root 3 when we simplify it. And all we have to do is get rid of the minus 1 by adding 1 to both sides. So y is equal to 1 plus or minus 2 root 3. Those are my y values, and that's the solution. Okay, in this question, it's fairly straightforward what they're asking. They want dy by dx for this y, um, but we can't differentiate that. Um, first of all, it's got the product in it. It's got two brackets multiplied, and we don't know how to deal with that at the moment. So we'll start by multiplying out the brackets. Okay, x squared plus 3x minus 8x, minus 24, still all divided by x, and I'll tidy the top up, replace 3x minus 8x with minus 5x, still divided by x. What about now? Uh, now, I still can't differentiate that because I've got a fraction, and x appears in the numerator and the denominator. You won't learn how to do that until next year. 
So please don't try to differentiate the top and the bottom. You have to split this up. Now, there's different ways to do this. I prefer to split it into separate fractions or with the denominator x. That way you can work at them one at a time. x squared over x is x, 5x over x is 5, and 24 over x for differentiation purposes is 24x to the power minus 1. Can we differentiate it now? Yes, we can. So that's what y is. So if we go ahead and differentiate that, um, x is going to give me a 1. Minus 5 doesn't give me anything. It goes to 0. And uh, x to the power minus 1 gives me minus 1 lots of x to the power minus 2. And it still has minus 24 in the front. So I can simplify that to 1 plus 24x to the power minus 2, or 1 plus 24 over x squared. Either of those is dy by dx in its simplest form. Part b, find an equation of the tangent to c at the point where x equals 2. Well, if you want to find the equation of a straight line, you're going to need two things, a point on the line and the gradient. So because what we were looking for is the tangent to c, the tangent to a curve has the same gradient as the curve at that point. So we need to find the gradient of c at this point here, when x equals 2. Um, we also need a point on the line, which means we need to know the y value as well. So for x equals 2, we need to find out the corresponding y value. So let's start with finding the gradient. dy by dx, we worked out in part a, is uh, 1 plus 24 over x squared. That's the most usable form of it. So I'll substitute in x equals 2, which is the point that we're dealing with. So 1 plus 24 over 2 squared is 1 plus 6, which is 7. There we go. Halfway there, I've got my gradient. Um, and now we just need to know the y value when x equals 2. So this is my expression for y. Don't use the expanded, messed up version. This one's really simple to use. Um, if you substitute x equals 2 into this, uh, well, we get 2 plus 3 times 2 minus 8, all divided by 2. So that's 5 times minus 6, which is thir minus 30, divided by 2. Uh, is minus 15. So that is the y coordinate, and we can give that a big tick. We've got the other thing that we need. So from here, it's fairly straightforward to work out the equation. You can use y equals mx plus c. I prefer y minus y1 is m times x minus x1. We'll put in the values we've got. So our y value is minus 15, our gradient is 7, and our x value is 2. Um, just tidy that up. y plus 15, multiply out the brackets. 7x minus 14, and we just simply subtract 15 from the left-hand side and the right-hand side, and we're left with y equals 7x minus 29. And there we are. That's the equation of the tangent at x equals 2.